you all for joining us this morning. Before I turn the call over, I need to advise that certain statements made during this call today may contain forward-looking information, and actual results could differ from the conclusions or projections in that forward-looking information, which include, but are not limited to, statements with respect to the estimation of mineral reserves and resources, the timing and amount of estimated future production, cost of production, capital expenditures, future metal prices, and the cost and timing of the development of new projects. For a complete discussion of the risks, uncertainties, and factors which may lead to actual financial results and performance being different from the estimates contained in the forward-looking statements, please refer to Yamana's press release issued yesterday announcing fourth quarter 2020 results, as well as the management's discussion and analysis for the same period and other regulatory filings in Canada and the United States. I would like to remind everyone that this conference call is being recorded and will be available for replay today at 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Replay information and the presentation slides accompanying this conference call and webcast are available on Yamana's website at yamana.com. I will now turn the call over to Mr. Danielle Russin, President and CEO. Thank you, Operator. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to our fourth quarter and year-end conference call. Presenting with me today are Jason LeBlanc, our Senior VP Finance and Chief of Financial Officer, Johan LeBlanc, Senior VP Operation, and Eduardo Fernandez, our Senior VP Corporate Development. For the Q&A portion, Henry Marsden, our Senior VP Exploration, and Craig Ford, our Senior VP Health, Safety, and Sustainable Development, will also be available. Starting, as always, with health, safety, environment, and community relation, our recordable injury injury rate was 0.49 in 2020. That represents a decline of more than 215% since 2012. We continue to refine and improve our protocol to combat COVID-19. At Canadian Malartic, we have installed a third-party testing lab, allowing site to test employees and contractors before they enter the mine. The lab is staffed by trained technicians and operates seven days a week. We also continue to engage closely with our host communities to support them in the fight against COVID-19, providing the nation and critical equipment and supplies. We achieved some notable milestone and recognition in 2020, as you can see on this slide. As we, you will have seen in our announcement yesterday, we have formally adopted a climate strategy further underscoring Yamana's commitment to transitioning to a low-carbon future. Our strategy is underpinned by the adoption of two targets, a two degree Celsius science-based target and an aspirational net zero target by 2050. The, tar the, the targets are supported by fundamental work to be performed in 2021 to establish a multidisciplinary climate working group and determine our emission baseline as part of the, our effort to achieve our target. These actions will help ensure that our long-range greenhouse gas emission reduction efforts are supported by practical and op operationally focused short, medium, and long-term action to achieve these targets. Yamana has a long history of prioritizing the health and safety of its people, sustainable development, and environmental protection wherever it operates. Our climate strategy is a natural extension of this business approach. Turning now to, our, to the 2020 highlight, we showed great resilience in the most challenging and unprecedented of years. We continue to deliver high ESG performance while moving quickly to ensure the health and safety of our people and the community where with the pandemic hit. We delivered strong operational performance with Jacobina, Canadian Malartic, El Pinion, and Minera Florida, all producing above plan. And that translated into strong financial performance and increased free cash flow. In fact, we achieved our objective of net debt to EBITDA ratio of below one when assuming a bottom of cycle goal price of 1350. This further increased our financial flexibility allowing us to raise our dividend by an additional 50% to 10.5 cents per share. On a per GEO basis, our dividend floor is now $100 per GEO. We completed our exploration program and delivered significant update supporting mine life extension. We 
continued to optimize our portfolio, monetizing certain assets such as our, our royalty portfolio and acquiring Monarch Gold, which added the Wazamak project to our pipeline and increased our present, presence in Quebec's pro prolific ABTB district. We completed an option agreement on our Suyai Gold project in Argentina, which we believe is an important step towards bringing this outstanding project to development. We also completed the integration of Agorica with Minera Anombrera, an important milestone that dearest what is known now as the Mara project. While we highlighted the significant net asset value as post pre feasibility study project, we note that net asset value was determined at metal prices well below current level. At current level, the net asset value doubles to $4 billion. We are not suggesting that this is what should be in models. We are saying that this is in an impressive, low capital intensity, low cost project with large copper and gold inventory, a robust production profile, long life, and excellent returns. In the next several quarters, we will begin to outline how we intend to improve and realize more value from this project. We have received a permit to advance the project yesterday, which is a positive news. And finally, we completed our listing on the London Stock Exchange, which provided us with exposure to investors in UK, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia that we didn't, have, we didn't have before, raising our profile while offering these investor exposure to our portfolio of high-quality assets in the Americas. Turning to our fourth quarter re result, we produced 221,659 ounces of gold with standout production from Jacobida and Minera Florida. Silver production was 2.59 million ounces, was above plan, underpinned by exceptionally strong performance from El Pinion. Geo production for the quarter was 255,361 thousand ounces. Cash cost of 675 per GEO and an all-in sustaining cost of 1,076 per GEO were modestly above forecast due to the tightening of national safety measure in Argentina and less production being classified as commercial production from Barnett at Canada Arctic. Jason will discuss costs in more detail during his remarks. Net earning during the quarter was 103 million or 11 cents per share, with adjusted net coming at 107.7 million or 12 cents per share. Cash flow from operating activities were 181.5 million and cash flow from operating activities before net change in working capital were 207.4 million. Free cash flow from before dividend and debt repayment was 61.7 million. We replaced gold mineral reserve depletion on a consolidated basis for our operation and we delivered significant increase in mineral resources, including 1.84 million ounces of inferred mineral resources at East Goldie on a 50% basis. East Goldie is part of the Odyssey underground project at Canadian Malarctic, which, as you have seen in our announcement yesterday, is proceeding to development, which we could not be more excited about. Johan will talk more about the project in a moment, but as a reminder, capital cost doesn't include the benefit that we will get revenue from, from 932,000 ounces coming from underground during the construction phase. The addition of Wazamak project also increased our mineral inventory at the favorable purchase price. Taking a closer look at our result, for the full year we reported geo production of 901,155 ounce, ounces including 779,810 ounces of gold and 10.36 million ounces of silver. Full year production exceeding our original guidance for the year of 890,000 ounce geo and was within the minus 3%, minus plus 3% of the variance range of the revised guidance. Jacobina continues to be a standout, producing 44,165 ounces of gold in the quarter, an all time and an all time record of 177,830 ounces for the year. It was the seventh straight years of increasing production for Jacobina, 
a trend that we believe is going to continue. Opinion produced 55,529 GEO in Q4, including 43,512 ounces of gold and 932,954 ounces of silver. Q4 production at Canadian Malartic was 86,371 ounces on a 50% basis. The transition from Canadian Malartic pit to Barnett pit is going very well. With Barnack now in commercial production, 70% of the total ton mined in 2021 are expected to come from Barnett. Minera Florida continued to perform exceptionally well, producing 26,352 ounces of gold during the quarter. This is the highest production level since 2010 and the second highest since the mines entered into production in 1986, excluding gold production from the reclamation of exterior tailings. Costs at Minera Florida are expected to continue declining in 2021. Cerro Moro produced 42,943 GO in Q4, including 21,259 ounces of gold and 1.67 million ounces of silver. Full year GO production was 132,415 ounces, including 66. 995 ounces of gold and 4.5 million ounces of silver. While Cerro Moro operated continuously during Q4, travel protocols were tightened and rosters significantly reduced to protect the health and safety of employees and communities. These restrictions were particularly stringent during December. Despite the impact of this restriction, production in Q4 was the highest of the year. Operation challenges related to COVID-19 are expected to continue in the first half of 2021, but the company expects the situation to normalize as the vaccination program ramps up in Argentina. The transition to more mill fill coming from underground ore at a higher grade than the open pit ore continued in the quarter and will continue in 2021, with most of the ore to plan to the plan coming from Escondida Far West, Zoe, Escondida Central and Escondida West Underground Mines. We expect to return to production of 1 million GEO per year this year and retain that production level for the next two years, the following two years. 53% of our production in 2021 is expected to occur in the second half of the year, with production trending higher each quarter. This year we expect production of 862,000 ounces of gold and 10 million ounces of silver. In 2022, we're forecasting 870,000 ounces of gold and 9.4 million ounces of silver. And in 2023, 889,000 ounces of gold and 8 million ounces of silver. As you may have noticed, we disclosed a three-year mine-by-mine guidance, a decision that underscores our confidence in forecasts. I would add that we see the three-year period as steady state on production and cash flow, while we lay the groundwork for significant growth beyond the, that period as we advance our project pipeline. We see cash costs ranging from 60, 65 to 695 per GO this year, with an all-in sustaining cost between 980 to 1,020. Our all-in sustaining cost in 2020 were mod, was modestly above forecast due to the aforementioned national safety measure in Argentina and also less production being classified as commercial production from Barnett at Canadian Maratic. The net result of the modestly higher cost and lower expansionary capital at Barnett was neutral. And there was little impact to overall general cash flow. Turning now to our updated reserve and resources, overall it was another successful year for our mineral reserve and resources with the replacement of reserve depletion at our operating mine. Reserve increased to 13.8 million ounces of gold, 113 million ounces of silver, and 6.7 billion pounds of copper. Of note here is the addition of our newly acquired Wazamak project, which added 1.8 million ounces of reserve to our pipeline. And as more of the adjustment really given to recently announced integration agreement between Agorica and Alhambra. We have included 56% of our share of the MARA project as part of our company subtotal. 
We also successfully increased measure and indicated resources to 14.6 million ounces of gold. In the inferred category, gold resources cranked to 15.7 million ounces. And with that, I will now turn the call over to Yuan to provide some more detail on our reserve, resources, and project pipeline. Very good. Thank you, Danielle. Well, as Danielle mentioned, we replaced the placement at our five operating mines and added ounces. Well, as a reminder, we are reporting our reserve using a gold price assumption of $1,250 per ounce, which has not changed from prior years. So all the increases that you see here reflect their success with exploration. We also increased measure and dedicated resources by 162,000 ounces of gold, and we increased and spurred resources by almost 2.2 million ounces. We will now have a closer look at our reserve and resources on a mine-by-mine -mine basis, starting with Canadian Malartic. Well, on a 50% basis, depletion from mining was 325,000 ounces in 2020. This was partially offset by a Barnett kit optimization which had 150,000 ounces of gold. The net depletion of Canadian Arctic was only 175,000 ounces in 2020. The additional open pit reserve at the bottom of the Barnett pit is equivalent to increasing open pit mine life by about six months. This will improve the production profile during the transition from open pit to underground mining. And the, optimi and the optimized pit design is offering a tolerable uh, geotechnical stability. We are proceeding with the development of the Odyssey underground project, and I will talk more about these exciting opportunities in a moment. I will also talk in, in, uh, in detail uh, about El Peñon and Jacobina in a moment, but note here that uh, they continue to be standout operation with Jacobina extending mine life despite increasing throughput and El Peñon increasing reserve from a third straight year as well as average reserve grade. Mara is now included in our reserve and resources total. With the completion of the integration, there is now a clear path to unlock value from the significant mineral reserve base, which includes 6.7 billion pounds of copper, such as mentioned by Daniel earlier. Uh, disruption due to COVID prevented Settle Model from adding new zones of high-grade and for resources during 2020, but some promising intersection at depth in Zoe and Escondida will be investigated further with diamond drilling in 2021. In addition, in, in addition for the first time, lower grade e pleach and for resources has been included in the mine in the mine resources statement. These answers are supported by positive metallurgical testing uh, I would, um, results, I would say, conducted earlier this year, and a positive concept study completed in 2020. Well, in, in summary, a significant reserve and resource base provide a solid foundation for a 10-year outlook and a pipeline for extension of the existing operation and future development of our quality projects. I will now move, move on with a quick update on our recent announced 10 years production outlook as several developments have occurred in the, in the interim. So uh, on the base, the base case is uh, for sure to sustain the platform of at least 1 million GEO through 2030. Since the update was announced, we had issued a positive construction decision for the Odyssey underground project. We have also updates on mineral reserve for 2020, disclosing an increase in reserves at Jacobina and another successful year of reserve replacement at El Pingon. And as I said a moment ago, our pipeline is now including Wazanak and, and Mara, giving us confidence that we can exceed that 1 million geo basis case outlook. So at Jacobina, we increased reserve by 314,000 ounces of gold, or 13%, to a total of 2.8 million ounces. This is the fourth consecutive year that Jacobina has increased reserve, with an average reserve uh, replacement rate of 240%. Average reserve grade has reduced slightly as a result of adding lower grade reefs in parallel to the high grade LU reefs at Canavera Fantas. We also increased mineral resources at Jacobina last year. The combined reserve and resource increase by 
826,000 ounces compared to 2019. This growth unlock opportunities for further expansion beyond our planned phase two of 8,500 tons per day and 230,000 ounces per year. Specifically, we're now evaluating a third expansion phase that would increase throughput to 10,000 tons per day by 2027 to 27 with a production potential of 270,000 ounces per year. So in 2021, drilling will continue to convert inferred resources to reserves while adding new zones of inferred resources such as Juan Belo South. El Peñal has another successful year replacing the place of reserve for, this, for the third straight year. So at year end 2020, reserves stood at 920,000 ounces compared to 764,000 ounces at the end of 2017. The new veins added to reserve are high quality, resulting in a slight increase to the average reserve grade. Well, gold and silver measure and dedicated resources increased by 16% and 17% respectively. And gold inferred resources increased 16% from 2019. A subset of these inferred resources are included in our 10 years production outlook. Although the average resource grade is lower than reserve grade, the subset of resources included in our mine plan is similar to the reserve grade. This is supported by the, um, the year end numbers where the resources that were converted to reserve throughout 2020 are higher than average reserves grade. The positive expression results at El Pingan support our 10 years production outlook, which rely on exploration success to maintain a rolling 10 years mine life. This is something really remarkable that this operation has been able to achieve for 21 years in counting. And go an ongoing success has the potential to unlock opportunities to ramp up production by leveraging the existing processing capacity. Now, taking a closer look at the RDT underground project, our resources have now increased to more than 14 million ounces on a 100% basis over a period of only six years. Uh, in the last year alone, we had a close to 4 million ounces of gold. As mentioned, mine life is estimate until 2039, which significant potential to extend beyond that. Production is expected to ramp up to 500 to 600,000 ounces of gold per year from 2029 through 2039. This is higher than our original estimate of 450,000 ounces per year. And the project has a robust economics, as you can see from the sensitivity table below. Initial expansion cap capital of 1.14 billion is expected to be spent over a period of eight years on a 100% basis with capital requirements fully founded using cash on end and free cash flow generation. Other growth, capital expenditure, and modest sustaining capex during the construction period are estimated at $191.4 million. Gold production during the construction period is expected to be 932,000 ounces at a cash cost of about $800 per ounce, which will significantly reduce external cash requirements. Sustaining CapEx from 2029 through 2039 is forecast at $55.8 million per year. It is important to note that only 7.3 million ounces of, or about 50% of the projected overall resources has been included in a technical report completed this month. So like I said, great potential for future upside. Well, East Malartic resources at depth and RDC internal zone present two of these opportunities. And of course, the East Goldie zone continues to expand. And first resources at East Goldie increased by 134% in 2020 to 6.4 million ounces on a 100% basis with an average grade of 3.17 grams per ton. In 2021, we're continuing to draw aggressively East Goldie to test the extension of the zone along strike and at depth. We will also drill Odyssey South for future mining. We look forward to updating you as the transition to underground Odyssey project is advancing. 
Well, in our long-term outlook uh, profile, the WASA Mac project provides an opportunity for production growth to exceed our 1 million GEO base case target. As a quick summary, we complete, uh, as a quick summary, we did complete our solution in January 21st of this year. The transition with Monarch Gold team has been excellent and Yamana already heavily, is already heavily involved in communicating with local stakeholders about the future plan for this operation. We expect to open a regional office in the upcoming months to support the community engagement. Well, WASAMAC is a well advanced project, and Monarch, Monarch completed a facility study in 2018 that showed a very good economics. We have begun an update on, on that study and expect to complete it by the third quarter of this year. The, the update will evaluate opportunities to achieve the following objective uh, minimize potential impact on the environment and communities, minimize, max, sorry, maximize throughput and optimize flow sheet and the gold recovery. And we're also going to refine the uh, geology block model. At least uh, we're also going to call, look at, we're looking at incorporate mining technology to establish what an act as a low cost underground operation. Well, and with that, I will now turn it over to Harado to discuss the MARA project. Thank you, Johan, and good morning, everyone. In December last year, we completed another key milestone for the MARA project with the signing of the joint venture agreement between Jamana and our partners, Glencore and Newmont. This important step is the last of a series of key developments which have taken the integration of Agarica and Alumbrera from a concept to a mature, high-quality, and unique development project. These steps included, among others, the creation of a joint team to advance the project not only on its technical aspects, but also to advance the permitting and the relationships with several stakeholders in the region and in the country. As such, MARA now has all the agreements in place with the local stakeholders and the GB partners to allow the project to continue to advance through the next stages of development and value creation. On the technical front, we have completed a series of studies to optimize the project and mitigate risk as part of the ongoing feasibility study, demonstrating significant improvements and opportunities in relation to the 2019 pre-feasibility study. For the next two years, our focus is to continue improving the project, advancing the feasibility study and environmental impact assessment. We also continue strengthening our social license through the execution of our CSR programs and our open communication and cooperation with the local communities and its stakeholders. On this front, now we have received all the administrative and judicial approvals needed to start our drilling campaign to support the feasibility study, and we're currently working on the procurement aspects and planning the mobilization of personnel to site or serving the provincial and internal COVID-19 regulations. MARA is a significant high-quality asset with a target production of over 450 million pounds of copper equivalent per year or 200,000 tons of copper equivalent per year at a 100% basis. Also at a 100% basis, is proven and probable reserves of 11.8 billion pounds of copper, 7.4 million ounces of gold, and over 100 million ounces of silver support a long mine life. The all sustaining costs of the project are expected to be in the second quartile of the global cost curve. And since the project requires relative, relatively low capital in relation to the scale, MIDA's capital intensity ranks amongst the lowest in the world for similar development projects. MIDA chose robust financial results and a strong leverage to copper price. As we have shown in the past, for a discount rate of 8%, the project has an MPV of $1.9 billion, using $3 per pound for copper and $1,300 per ounce for gold. For reference, if we consider the current spot prices for both metals, we can see an MPV at an 8% discount rate reaching near $4 billion, and we can see an internal rate of return of over 30%, which underpins the high quality and value of this project, especially in a strong copper market. For more information on the MARA project, please visit our website. All things considered, this project represents a significant value opportunity, whether that is through Yamana's development of the project or the development of strategic partnerships or perhaps within a public vehicle. For now, the best way for us to maximize its value is to advance the project through feasibility, permitting, and in general, through its development cycle. And with that, I will hand it over now to Jason to discuss the financial. Uh, thank you, Gerardo, and uh, good morning, everyone. 
Turning now to our financial performance for Q4, revenue in the quarter was $461.8 million compared to $383.8 million in the same period of 2019, a 20% increase. Gross margins excluding DD&A rose 38% to $295 million from $214.4 million in the year earlier period. Earnings during the quarter were $103 million or 11 cents per share, compared with $14.5 million or 2 cents per share a year earlier. On an adjusted basis, earnings were also 11 cents per share versus 3 cents per share last year. Our capital spend during Q4 was similar to last year, but higher than the recent Q3 as anticipated because of the timing of our ability to spend during COVID. Sustaining, expansionary, and expiration spending increased 25%, 260 percent and 56 percent respectively compared to Q3 just passed. Turning now to cash flows. Cash flow from operating activities was 181.5 million dollars while cash flows from operating activities before net change in working capital were 207.4 million dollars. Cash flow generation is at multi-year highs and I would note that this comparison includes periods with considerably higher production from mines that have since been divested. Despite the strong cash flow, there were, se- there were several t- timing items in Q4 that impacted the cash flow generation. I already mentioned the higher quarter over quarter capex, but also the timing of interest payments, which are paid in Q2 and Q4, working capital movements quarter to quarter, and the impact of production exceeding sales in Q4, which will normalize during this year. During Q4, we saw our cash balances increase by $53 million from Q3 after the repayment of the $100 million outstanding balance on a revolving credit facility, which was drawn early in COVID, although unused during the year. With the growing cash, we achieved our objective of a leverage ratio of net debt to EBITDA below one turn when assuming a bottom up cycle gold price of 1350 per ounce, which underscores our significant and growing financial flexibility. With our current and expected growth in cash balances, we have the financial flexibility to continue supporting our three capital allocation objectives. Those include maintaining our conservative leverage policy, supporting our capital investment needs, including our targeted growth opportunities at Malarctic and Jacobina, and lastly, maintaining a sustainable dividend, which will increase with growing cash balances and cash flows. Turning to a few other Q4 financial highlights. These charts show our total cash flow profile for the year, with operating cash flows in 2020 totaling $618 million and free cash flow before dividends and debt repayments of $295 million, more than 200% higher than 2019. Cash and equivalents at year end were $651.2 million. This includes cash acquired on the integration of Agrarica with Alambrera, now Mara, in Q4 with a balance of $223.1 million at year end. This cash is available for utilization by the MARA project. Upon the integration, Yamana as 56.25% controlling shareholder will now consolidate 100% of the accounts of MARA in our financial results and prospectively will show the 43.75% interest of our joint venture partners as a minority interest. For the quarter, Cash costs and all sustaining costs were modestly higher than forecast due to production and cost impacts at Cerro Moro following the reimposition of national safety measures in Argentina in December. Had Cerro Moro not had this impact and performed as anticipated, our consolidated costs would have been within our prior plans. In addition, we had anticipated that more production from Barnett at Canadian Malarctic would be classified as commercial production and would have positively impacted costs. However, the margin generated from higher than expected pre-commercial production at Barnat was treated as a reduction to expansionary capital. This significant cash flow benefit reduced expansionary capital by a further $14 million in 2020 compared with plan. The net result was that there was no impact on cash flows. As we updated in our January 25th preliminary results announcement, we were expecting a net impairment reversal related to El Peñon and Cerro Moro with our Q4 results. That ended up being a pre-tax net impairment reversal of $191 million, represented by a $560 million impairment reversal at El Peñon and a $369 million impairment at Cerro Moro. At El Peñon, 
the strong recent mine performance across production, costs, and exploration success resulted in the reversal. At Cerro Moro, it was challenges in these factors from the opposite perspective compared to the prior expectations, but also quite significantly, the impact of export taxes on cash flow. Despite this result, we still believe strongly in the long-term value opportunity at Cerro Moro, especially from expiration, although the shorter term result was the impairment of the asset. Taking a look at capital spending guidance for 2021, we are forecasting expansionary capital spend of $132 million this year, sustaining capital spend of $183 million and total expiration spending of $110 million. The expansionary number is higher than what we initially guided for 21 back in January as we hadn't approved the construction of the Odyssey project then, but that capital is now included. Of note in expiration, $18 million will be directed towards our generative program, which includes both early stage and advanced exploration projects, such as Monument Bay and La Rovea. We are confident we will advance at least one of these projects to our longer term goal of a mineral inventory large enough to support a mine with an annual gold production rate of 150,000 ounces for at least eight years. Our exploration budget also allocates $18 million to Cerro Moro, underscoring our commitment to the operation and confidence in our ability to expand the mineral resource at this operation and extend its mine life. And with that, I will turn the call back over to Daniel for some final remarks. Thank you, Jason. In closing, I would like to once again highlight the resilience of our people who perform exceptionally well under challenging circumstances to drive strong results. We believe we've positioned ourselves extremely well for the near term and long term with the Jacobina phase expansion, exploration upside at our existing mine coupled with the initiative like Odyssey, Wazamak, and Mara that will secure our long time growth for decades. And as our, our cash flow and cash balances continue to rise, our financial flexibility rise with it, allowing us to advance this project while continuing to increase return and invest in our future. And with that, we'll be happy to take your question. Operator? Thank you. We will now take questions from the telephone lines. If you have a question and you're using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before making your selection. If you have a question, please press star 1 on your device's keypad. If at any time you wish to cancel your question, please press the pound sign. Please press star 1 at this time if you have a question. There will be a brief pause by the participants register. Thank you for your patience. The first question is from Ralph Profiti of 8 Capital. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, Daniel, the MDNA talks about uh, phase three expansion potential at Jacobina. Um, I'm just wondering sort of high level thoughts. I know it's early, but, you know, would you see this as sort of very dependent on finding some of those near mine ore sources like Canavieras and Moro do Vento? And, and particularly, how do you think about the strategic reserve life, which, which has up until now has been about 20 years? Do you think you can maintain that in the 10,000 ton per day, per day scenario in the context of the tailings capacity? Well, good morning, Raf. Thank you for your question. Yeah, we, as we have done for phase two uh, expansion, you know, we wanted to make sure that our reserve and resources were n not impacted by the increase in tonnage. And then that's what we will do for phase three. Uh, Johan mentioned that we're aiming for 2027, so still six years away of, of doing that expansion to 10,000 uh, ton per day. So in three years, we'll be at 85. We'll continue to do like we did with phase one optimize the mill, and then probably slow, slowly with time, you know, increase production. There's basically almost no work or capital needed for that phase three. It's just an increase in, in development and production underground. But with the new mill update for phase two, uh, we'll be able to reach the tonnage uh, with the, the, new, the new mill. So our target is always to maintain that reserve life. So that's why we will continue to drill. We have a, a very good budget on exploration in the coming years, a bit higher than what we had in the past year, exactly for that, that we, we want to maintain the, uh, the reserve level to the actual with an increased production. Regarding the tailings, uh, you know, with uh, 
with that phase two, now we will do a backfill system. And the backfill mm -hmm. system is exactly a 2,000 ton per day. So any new tons that we will put to the mill, we don't want to reduce the mine life of the, the tailings. That is extremely long right now. We want to maintain that. And anything, you know, any production above the 6,500 tons per day at the mill will go back as backfill underground to maintain our tailing. We have many other areas that we already know that we can have tailings in the future, but that's important for us to, to maintain the actual mine life of the tailing, in, 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 even if we increase the production. So you're right in all what you said. Our target is always to maintain our you know 20 years mine life, even if we increase uh, you know production by being successful on, on, on exploration. And then we have many targets. All these uh, reef are all extending at that. We're finding new one, and the grid is getting better. So, so uh, we don't see any issue to go in that production in the future. Yeah, got it. That, that's quite clear now. Thanks. Um, at a high level on, on the Wasamec property, now that you're seeing much clearer you know, economics and robust economics, at Canadian Malartic, has this changed your thinking at all on standalone versus integration with Canadian Malartic? No, not really. We're studying uh, both, but you know, our our priority number one is is really to have standalone. We have the the room to put the mill, uh, and then the main reason why we want a standalone is for a backfill system. Also, Raf, uh, the advantage of having backfill at site. And you know we're going to recover 95 to 100 percent of the ore underground if we have backfill. If we leave open stoke, then that will be re reduced significantly. So you're developing all these zones, but you have to live a lot in pillars. When you have a backfill system, you you can't fill the stoke and recover mostly all of your uh, reserve. And then we have high reserve. We know this resource and reserve will increase with uh, the start of drilling this year. So. A mill at site makes a lot more sense for us than than taking of uh, custom milling, and then you have to also assume that it's uh, it's 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 a long distance to travel. Uh, you know, uh, a big production uh, each day. You know, in the feasibility study, uh, it was a 6,500 tons per day on uh, underground operation. We're thinking uh, a lot higher than that uh, right now in the revised study we're doing. I got it. I see that now. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. The next question is from Don McLean of Paradigm Capital. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Well, good morning, guys, and um, congratulations on the uh, Malartic Underground. That's a that's a tremendous value creation and a, a lot of good done for that area of uh, of Canada. Um, I just wanted maybe I'll start with uh, if Henry's on the line or maybe Johan. Talk about the fact that it only uses half of the resources in the projected life to 2039. Um, could we talk a bit about the other half of the resources that have been left behind? Why and uh, what what might happen with those if one considers an $1,800 gold world instead of I think it was um, $1,500. Maybe it was 1250 for the cutoff. Um, so what what can we expect to happen with the existing resource? And then uh, you continue to work on East Gouldy exploration. What what's the outlook for that? Because my sense is this is a multi-decade mine, not not just 11 years. Uh, thank you, Don. Good mo good morning. Good good question. Uh, you know, to do uh, to start the study, we had to use what we have. Uh, you can assume for sure that the other seven million ounces, we're going to drill them. And as the as we build a mine, we all know that the production uh, mine life will increase at Manarctic. Right now, we're focusing on that first seven million ounces. That's more defined than the rest. But uh, you know, we have a LT exploration budget uh, this year to to you know to more define. Uh, the East Gold, the uh, mine, and as we now driving the ramp down, by the end of this year, we're going to be in good position to drill from underground, and you know, Titan drilling on Odyssey uh, South will be the first uh, zone to be mined at Malartic Underground, but also to better define, you know, East Gold uh, with time. So, you know, even if we it's a PA and then we use resources, we have we wanted to use the best 
or quality, not the best quality, but the, the, the resources that was, you know, drilled tighter than, than the rest. So I think with time, it will only increase in the in the future. And then this is why the study right now is only uh, including these uh, half of the resources, actually. And then, you know, we have also a lot of resources uh, at East uh, Malartic, and then we have included only uh, East Malartic down to 600 meters. So there's huge potential in the future to increase uh, more than that 11 years. We we all know that it will be multi-decades, like you say. So so is uh, East Gouldy a case of lack of drill density, or is it, um, um, it, it was it an economic cutoff? It's not an economic it cutoff. Uh, Don is basically drilling. Okay, but would, so was uh, East Malartic, though, more of an economic cutoff? Just depth with the ramp because the shaft will access first uh, the East Goldie. So, you know, uh, East Malartic is quite deep, too, and then there's a, a certain depth you can mine East Malartic uh, and Odyssey uh, at depth. But as we go down with the ramp and we go down with the shaft and then access more level, then eventually we'll increase also uh, the ounces of, of East Malartic uh, deeper. But East Goldie is open on all directions, too. So And it's the better grade of the tree the tree zone, so you, you, I'm sure you understand that's uh, that's the priority number one. But with you know we're seven years away of, uh, of seven eight years away of being fully in production at Malartic, so a lot of things will change during this, these these years as we're going to drill them more. But they are not uh, cut off related. They're basically you know, not drill enough or not in a position with the, the mine planning right now to, to put them into uh, the the production. Great. Okay, thanks, Danielle. My, my other question, that maybe you may, might be Peter, is about the, the Mara project. Um, you know, we've been watching this for years, and it's great that it has, the integration has taken place and it's progressed. Um, but your decision to integrate it into your reserves and resources and, uh, and financials is a you know, significant step. Um, there's always been multiple options for the project. Uh, have have your plans for it, though, within Yamana, about how it's going to fit into Yamana. Have those plans changed or narrowed at all as uh, as time has progressed? And and are you seeing interested buyers? I guess that might be the, another important question. Uh, I'll start to answer it, and then maybe Arlo can can add on it. But you know, Arlo made made it clear in this part of the presentation. There's many options for Mara. But right now, mm -hmm. uh, we have to stay the course. We have to continue to do uh, the feasibility study, complete that, stu that study by the end of this year, early next year. But most importantly, you know, uh, the permitting phase. Now we have the permit, to, the permit to get access to the site. That was a key permit to get because we have to go do some condensation drilling to complete the feasibility study. But we have to keep mm -hmm. all our options open, you know, it's clear that we can bring, we can, we can do it, but it will change the uh, what the company will look like with more uh, copper production. Uh, still, significant goals if we 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 maintain our 56%. If we bring a financial partner, then we'll reduce our stake, and then we'll still be involved. We can sell all of it, but uh, we don't think it will be an option. And the latest option is is why don't we 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 form a copper company that we have its own management, and it's it's also an option. We're not finalized at which one we will use uh, or what's the best one for now because, like I said, permitting and completing the feasibility study is our priority number one right now. Okay, great. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Maybe uh, I don't want to occupy this for too long, but one last question I think everybody's wondering about the Molartic underground and the 900 some odd thousand ounces of pre-production, maybe Jason can just tell us, is Malartic, the underground, is that going to be self-funded if we keep these kind of gold prices? Um, and would it be self-funded if we include the cash flow from the open pit? Yeah, Don, uh, absolutely. And that, that, that 1550 gold price that you mentioned, that, that's the case. It would be uh, kind of a multiple cover on kind of the integrated cash flow generation compared to to the underground uh, capex, but when you you know if you have, if you toggle over to spot, then it's going to be a 
you know, further further multiples of, of the needs there. So I think it's a unique attribute of the of the project having uh, all that uh, production over the construction period to to subsidize um, subsidize the ultimate construction there. So. So from a, from a net free cash flow from the Malartic project, will it still continue to contribute net free cash flow to Yamana if we stay at these kind of prices? Yeah, very, very much so, Don. I say it's pretty pretty robust at these prices. You can kind of do both. You're going to have that uh, contribution from the open pit net of all the construction costs on the underground. So that's as I said, that's at the study cost of the 1550, but even more so at uh, at the prices we see here today. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Mike Parkin of National Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Hi, guys. Just wanted to confirm the ten-year plan does include the the newest numbers on the Odyssey Underground, or is it still assuming the smaller scale that was kind of previously communicated? Good morning, Mike. It's including the the new the new numbers you see you saw yesterday for okay. the presentation today. But does it but still, also in still does does include other potential upside on top of of that, like low grade stockpile, or you know between now and then the end of construction, a lot of things will happen at Manatee, and that might that might change. But when we we said uh, we we presented our ten years, it's the with the new numbers. Okay, that was actually my next question about the stockpile. If that was factored in there, no, do you have a sense of? Okay, and do you have a sense of what gold price you, the the joint venture partnership would want to see to to factor in that low grade stockpile? Well, that the actual gold price we we can include it in 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 there now, but we've decided not for this uh, at this time of the the study. It might be included in the in the future. But you know, okay, that's you want the to match it, or, yeah, at fifteen fifty, yeah. Okay, super. All right, that's it for me, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. The next question is from Jackie Przbalowski of BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, most of my questions have been answered. I guess uh, one that would be helpful would be just some clarification with the uh, Malarctic Underground. Uh, drill exploration program for 2021. Uh, can you give us a sense? Are you prioritizing infill drilling uh, to move more of what you already have delineated into uh, into like a M and I um, category, or are you still testing the boundaries of the ore bodies? And would that sort of step out drilling be a higher priority at this point? Well, good morning, Jackie. Good question, Henry. Why don't you answer that one? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jackie. There's about a $30 million budget um, for exploration. The majority of that is uh, infill on East Goldie. We'll be looking to take it to about 80 meter centers and uh, and an indicated category. But there is $4 million that we'll be looking at extensions of the uh, zone. So the zone remains uh, wide open, um, down plunge especially. Um, to the east, and uh, somewhat up plunge off to the east as well. So there's there's a significant component of uh, both aspects, but the main push is is definitely to get stuff to indicate a category. Okay, that, that's it for me. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Once again, please press star 1 at this time if you have a question. And the following question is from John Tomazos of John Tomazos Very Independent Research. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Thank you. Sometimes the best acquisitions are the ones you already have. I'm thinking of the Mara project. Now that copper and gold uh, prices have rebounded, is it likely that you're going to keep a bigger part of it or Instead of selling a gold stream to do a financing, is there a structure where you sell part of your copper stake? Glencore, your partner, likes copper. Royal Gold has a copper stream. Where you keep the entire gold participation and reduce the copper participation to fund the CapEx. 
Uh, good morning, John. Uh, good, good question. It's you know, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of option on on Mara, and then you're right with copper going up and gold going out. That that project is is becoming more and more important for the company, and then we own it at 56.25 percent. So that's that's important, and that is why we're not in a rush to do anything. We'll come continue the feasibility study, the permitting, and evaluate all the options, and then we'll do what's the best for the uh, for the company in the future. But right now, you know, all these options you mentioned plus the one we have are a good option. We have to see what will happen. But right now, we stay the course on on what needs to be done to complete the, the fee study and the permitting. And it's going it's going well right now. Thank you. Well, just John, if I may add this is Sarah, but I think that you have, you also have to consider that a project like this most likely will have project debt, perhaps in, in a range of fifty up to seventy percent. So the amount that needs to be financed by the partner is not a hundred percent of the capital. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Tim Huff of Peel Hunt. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, I know you've been focusing a lot on um, Malartic and Jacobina, but just from a, from an expl exploration perspective, I mean, you're obviously allocating a good deal of a, a good deal of exploration spend towards Saramora and El Pañon this year, but you've also got a life of mine extension. That you're that you're aiming for Monero, Florida, Florida, eventually. I, how would you rank those three in terms of your 21 exploration focus? I mean, a, a lot of it depends on what you find. I know, but if if you were to prioritize those three in order, how how would it sort of work for the coming year? Well, good afternoon, Tim. Uh, good question. You know, <laughs> they're all important for for us for sure. Uh, you know, Malartic is a big, big mine, big project. So, you know, the more we can we can convert into, uh, you know, the confidence into the resources, that's an important one. Jacobina has already many years of uh, of production, so it is it is maybe less important. But if we want to increase throughput in the future, uh, that's also important. I think Wasamac is a key one too, uh, because we we. We want to build that mine. We want to update our feasibility study this year, and then we know this huge potential uh, of extension. So we don't really put priority when we do our exploration budget. Uh, Henry and the team they come with 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 ideas, and along the years we see what the success we have in exploration, and then very often in the past few years, even in nine, yes uh, last year with COVID-19, we you know we have a Extended the exploration budget at, at El Pinon and at uh, at Canadian Malartic. El Pinon, you asked the question. It's, it's a great question. El Pinon, after 21 years, you once said we already care, we already carry above 10 years in our in our strategic mine life of the mine. And it's important. El Pinon is fully built. It's fully paid for. So each ounces we're finding there, it's an healthy budget. But any ounces we find there, there are at low cost, and then. There are a lot of free cash flow generated from that mine. So we, we don't really go by priority when it comes to the time for exploration. We, we spend the money that needs to be spent at each of our mines and also on our generative exploration program. And that's how we, we define. We have a, like a budget for total exploration, but it's not really, really a, a priority for any of them. They're all important in our, in our mind. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. Um, and, and just one one last one. You you mentioned that you've uh, established that new uh, climate action uh, initiative of establishing the two degree SBT. Um, you you've mentioned the baseline and and the greenhouse gas ga gas pathways that you want to establish. But is the ultimate aim of what you're trying to do in 21 is it more of that establishing operation specific abatement projects? Um, and do you expect to have those cost schedules and, and initial sort of ideas done by the end of this year? Yes, Tim. That's our target. We, Like I mentioned, we're going to put that uh, group, a working group together. Uh, that's our target to have for each mine uh, a specific target uh, uh, 
defined this year. So I don't know, Craig, if you, you want to add more on this, but that's that's our target. Hi, hi Tim, and, and thanks, Danielle. Yeah, Tim, just to, to build on what Danielle said, that is the plan. Uh, 2021 is really is a planning year, a foundational year, to have all the, the work in place so that by the end of the year we can have those preliminary operations centric uh, emissions abatement pathways. Okay, that's great. That's it for me. Thanks very much and well done. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. There are no further questions registered at this time. I'll turn the meeting back over to Mr. Essin. Well, thank you, Operator. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to updating you on our first quarter in April. Please take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. The conference has now ended. Please disconnect your lines at this time. We thank you for your participation.